Reed, uh, last week with DevShe, we talked about how AI can reshape and reframe public systems that are overburdened at best, I'd say, and um, perhaps broken at worst. Uh, what are like what are the other specific public sector spaces that you think that AI could have an immediate impact on right now? I think the answer is a huge number. Um, and matter of fact, we could do an entire podcast or even series on all of the different areas. But, you know, and there's a number of different organizations like Code for America to try to provide essential services. There's companies uh, like Phaedrus Ellis Lampkins, uh, Promise, um, kind of doing a, you know, kind of financial systems management and having a really good business model that aligned the business model for elevating the cases of these under-resourced communities. And those are just examples within what we know. There's obviously tons of stuff within education, legal, medical, economic, you know, justice, all of these areas. It's one of the reasons why public service technology is really important. And then AI, the revolution it's bringing is a natural language interface together with a depth of knowledge to help bring these kind of intelligence and cognitive tools from everything from, you know, an individual community member to, you know, uh, cases like with DevShe, public defenders who are doing an important, critical role in our society to make sure that innocent people don't get, you know, accidentally convicted and that people's rights are respected. You know, even if in the case where, for example, you know, you might have some weed in the trunk, but the way that they, that weed is discovered, the, the importance is how the rights play, because rights aren't just for wealthy people, they're for all people. And it's interesting, you know, one of the things that Dave, she said last week was that you don't always even need the cutting edge technology to make government work better. Like, obviously, we want the, you know, the best of the best to be working in our government. But sometimes there's actually simple technologies that can make things a lot better. And I've heard you say many times, like, one of the things we need is more folks in government, whether that's elected or people who are in um, positions of government, to just have technology experience, to understand it, to maybe have a stint in the private sector, to be schooled in it, to have education. Like that can go a long way if we just have folks who understand and appreciate what technology can do for us. And so it was interesting hearing about her background. I mean, she had intern stints at Microsoft Research and DeepMind, um, Peking University, Stanford Law. Like, I imagine your answer is probably going to be both. But do you see more sort of generational founders in the AI space coming from the private sector, academia, both? How do you see those interplay? Well, I think we want to figure out how to enable as much, you know, kind of technological knowledge in government and public services we can. Um, you know, basically, you know, technology is transforming the landscape of what's possible. Tra uh, technology enables what can happen at scale and society is always scale. Whether it's government officials making decisions and making intelligent decisions about how technology does this, whether it's a lot of technology deployment happens within private sectors. So the knowledge of like scale software systems like AI and on that kind of application, a lot of new inventions um, and kind of, you know, looking at the world sideways or depth of research conditions come from universities, which also specifically train people um, to kind of have the skills for, you know, kind of modern work, modern, universe, you know, modern um, industry, uh, you know, modern society. And, and so the short answer, we're going to need all of it. Um, and you can't just do universities because, for example, like with AI, a lot of the kind of the in-depth uh, AI revolution is coming from corporations um, because they um, are our best technology in the entire world and every society in the world for how do you assemble a bunch of resources on a risky competitive adventure. And, and, and so the AI development is from there more than universities, not zero from universities, but more as is part of that, how it's happening right now today. But also, of course, you know, like in the cases with like DevShe, you have young people who go, I want to be dedicating my life to solving these kinds of public problems. And she kind of got the experience within these research organizations, understand what it is, and then immediately went into entrepreneurship, creating the product and business and 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 sustaining institutions 
that are new businesses in order to make it happen. So in some sense, she's a little bit more from academia than from industry as a way of doing this, but you need that kind of youthful energy as well. And we are so far behind on how it is we get technology into the public sphere, in part because people overly go, the public sphere must be completely separate from the corporate sphere. And actually, in fact, figuring out new ways of public-private par partnerships, I think are going to really key. And obviously, there's challenges to navigate, like you don't want to have the corruption of having public coffers go into, you know, private industry where all it is is a is not the solving the problem, but it's just, you know, kind of a capturing of a sales channel versus the solving of a societal need. And you have to you have to worry about that kind of stuff in in these things. But because the scale technology is essentially only built within the private sphere, especially within a bunch of what's going on in AI, we need to to align good public-private missions. And of course, I think we do that as well. So zooming out to the AI space more broadly, um, speaking of that, that private industry that can have the capital and resources to do big things, not too long ago, as everyone knows, OpenAI raised what I think was the largest venture capital deal of all time. Um, they raised $6.6 .6 billion. And what do we think about this? Is this an anomaly? What does this mean for the AI space? And do you think we're going to see more funding rounds of this magnitude in the future? Well, I think it's unique. Um, and, you know, uh, because it's a particular path by which open AI, you know, kind of uh, stays to a nonprofit mission, starts as a nonprofit, scales a company that's a, you know, kind of a public benefit corp uh, for navigating. Uh, these particular things and is focused on, you know, AI for the benefit of humanity. It's a first, but it's probably not a first that will never be repeated. You know, part of what happens as we get to this kind of globally connected world um, is we do see all throughout the entire venture industry, venture capital rounds, you know, uh, scaling. When I started my own career, you know, kind of a couple hundred thousand dollar seed round was like a big deal. And, you know, now, you know, seed rounds can be even tens of millions of dollars, yep. <laughs> right, in some cases. And then, we, of course, we get to, as the whole venture industry also scales out, we have more entrepreneurs like Devshi, Phaedra, others who are like, how do we make the business models work for the scaling of the impact? And that it runs as a company, but it runs as a company that fits into a critical part of improving societal infrastructure that uh, helps the kind of lower income communities, um, you know, navigate life better, uh, potentially, you know, uh, have a better opportunity at the American dream for improving themselves because they have a more stable basis and I, and that kind of a, uh, are a more integrated part of society. And, you know, in Devshi's case, the rights that come with that in Phaedra's case, the, the financial management. Um, and so um, I think that we'll see all of this happen. But now to the AI thing, I think we're just at the beginning of what AI will mean for society, for work, for individuals' lives. And I think that these financing rounds um, were not at market peak or at market beginning. Well, so question about that. Obviously, the folks who are building their own models, training and creating their own models like, you know, OpenAI are raising these, you know, eye-popping eye rounds. 20 years ago, people would be like, what is going on? But I feel like a lot of other people say that because, you know, AI can enhance what a company can do, you know, a company can do so much more with five people or 10 people, they're not going to need as much money to scale. Do you also see in a way that maybe some companies will be raising less or, or no venture capital at all because they don't need it? Like, do you see in some ways it's going to be less or no? You think that it's just going to continue the trend of raising more and more dollars? Well, I think there will be a range. So sometimes there will be smaller rounds. But I don't think AI, even though it's kind of provisioned by, you know, Microsoft, OpenAI, Google, Anthropic, kind of the hyperscalers in these things, it will enable certain things to be cheaper. But just like, for example, you know, it used to be you have to would buy have to buy, and many of our listeners may not even know what this is, a whole bunch of very expensive sun equipment in order to do server stuff. Now 
you can use the cloud. It's it's a much cheaper and more dynamic infrastructure. But that still means that you need to like raise a bunch of money to realize your market opportunity, hire people. It's a competitive thing frequently between company one, company two, company three. Capital is part of the competition. So I think broadly speaking, we do get to larger and larger capital raises within kind of a, a more globally connected market, a more globally competitive market, uh, et cetera. And, and kind of as people realize that massive returns are possible, more capital flows in. Will flow. And so AI's transformation of every industry will mean that more capital is flowing in, that people will then deploy to get to market, you know, blitz scaling more quickly, et cetera. So it, isn't, it doesn't lead to smaller capital allocations. Possible is produced by Wonder Media Network. It's hosted by Ari Finger and me, Reid Hoffman. Our showrunner is Sean Young. Possible is produced by Katie Sanders, Edie Allard, Sarah Schleed, Adrian Bain, and Paloma Moreno Jimenez. Jenny Kaplan is our executive producer and editor. Special thanks to Surya Yalamanchili, Saida Sepieva, Ian Ellis, Greg Beato, Ben Rellis, Parth Patil, and Little Monster Media Company.